So I wanted to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! video games today because I feel like they're actually a little bit stagnant. And I'll explain what I mean. By the way, this video is going to be kind of unscripted and off the dome, so if I ramble a little bit, just bear with me. But anyway, so right now, it might seem strange to say that Yu-Gi-Oh! games are stagnant since we have exactly what a lot of us have wanted for years. We've got Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, which is an official you know, digital simulator. You can play it on any console, you can play it on your PC and on your phone, and it's got the Master Rules, five zones, 8,000 life points, you know, it's a huge full card pool and kind of its own format, but it's similar enough to the TCG. This is something that we really did wait like years for Konami to finally release. And it's here and it's great. You know, it looks great. It runs great. I like the music. I like the presentation. I love being able to just hop online and climb the ladder. It's, you know, maybe lacking a little bit in terms of like different formats and modes, but overall Master Duel is definitely a success. And it's even pretty free to play friendly, I would argue. There's also Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, which is the mobile game, and it's actually technically been around for like twice as long, more than that, than Master Duel has. And it's cool because like you can kind of play the simplified Yu-Gi-Oh! game on your phone, and it's really easy. They even also have it on PC if you want to. So I find it's really good for like playing on a commute or just kind of playing during some break time. And you know, you've got a more simplified like three zone Yu-Gi-Oh! Obviously it's had its own kind of fair share of power increases and new summoning mechanics and things like that. So it plays kind of somewhat similarly to how modern Yu-Gi-Oh! plays, but it's a little more simplified. There's like skill cards, there's different dual worlds. It is a little bit more anime based, which is something that I'm gonna probably be talking about a lot more later on in the video. There's like, you know, different dual worlds. There's like the Arc 5 world, there's the 5Ds world. They have like different specific duels with specific rules. And there are even 3D animations and dual links compared to the kind of like animated 2D ones in Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. And those look really great too. I like dual links. I like Master Duel. I want to be clear out the gate that I think that these are both great games. And if you're a Yu-Gi-Oh! fan and you just like, you know, playing the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game, then you can't really go wrong with either of these games. So why do I say then that I feel like Yu-Gi-Oh! games are stagnant? Well, it's because I actually don't find that Master Duel or Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links are really video games exactly. Certainly not Master Duel. Duel Links maybe a little bit more so, but I guess what I mean by that is like, you know, Master Duel is kind of just, it's like a service. Like it's a mobile game, but it's like a service, you know? You kind of like log in, everything is server side, and you just kind of like, get the cards, you open the packs, and like you pull cards and like you duel people, but it's effectively just a game that's a service. There's not really like a story mode to it. Um, there are single player gates, which you can kind of use to learn about decks. But other than that, there's really not a lot of like gameplay to be had. And technically the same kind of goes for Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. There is at least, like I said, more of that like anime representation and a few different dual worlds and stuff to conquer. But ultimately these are kind of like games as services. There are events and stuff like that, like timed events. They're kind of like, you know, free to play, but you can also like pay for gems and currency. What I'm missing in Yu-Gi-Oh! is the period of time where Yu-Gi-Oh! games were uh, adventurous and Yu-Gi-Oh! games were ambitious. And it's kind of weird for me to actually talk about this because I, when I first started playing Yu-Gi-Oh! in 2002, I was actually more of a card game person. And even though I consumed a lot of different Yu-Gi-Oh! things, like I would go to any tournament I could find, I would go to Books A Million, I would go to Walmart, I remember playing a tournament at a water park of all places. And I would love to like buy packs and find merch and like I always wanted to buy a dual disc and I think I eventually maybe got one and like I liked having t-shirts and stickers, but the one thing I didn't actually get a lot of exposure to was the Yu-Gi-Oh! video game. And it's a little bit strange to think about because looking back, I really feel like I missed out. Now I did play a few of them. I remember playing like Dark Duel Stories on Game Boy Color, and I remember playing like maybe one game on GameCube, a couple other like, DS games like here and there, but I really didn't play a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! games, and so I've been kind of like revisiting some of them. And I just wanted to talk about the different Yu-Gi-Oh! games because I think that Yu-Gi-Oh! had a period of time where Konami and just the different companies that they would outsource the Yu-Gi-Oh! video game development to really felt like they took risks with Yu-Gi-Oh! And like there are some of the early games are a little bit wonky. You've got things like, you know, Forbidden Memories and Dark Duel Stories, where Dark Duel Stories on the Game Boy Color was literally just like kind of a super repetitive duel fest. It was actually kind of a hard game because you start out with really weak, weak monsters. Like we're talking, you know, 450, 550 attack points. And you have to basically just grind in levels against a bunch of different characters. So like you'll have to duel like Tristan and Joey and like Mai and Yugi and Taya like, you know, five times each to progress to the next level where you'll have a few more duelists and you'll have to duel each of them five times each to eventually, you know, build up like points and get cards. And there's like a basic crafting system you can use to get different cards that you need. 
Um, it's not like a super deep or amazing game. In fact, I really feel like Yu-Gi-Oh! didn't translate very well to those small Game Boy Color screens, but that was more of a limitation of the technology at the time. Still though, I mean, like it worked. And if you think about like what it would take to just keep a kid satisfied, like, you know, if you give this to your eight year old and they just like Yu-Gi-Oh! then they'll probably just have fun kind of mashing buttons and playing it. And ultimately, you know, they can beat the game and they'll feel like they got a lot of play time out of it if nothing else, because I mean, there is a lot of repetition to it. But then there's also Forbidden Memories on PlayStation 1. And this is actually the Yu-Gi-Oh game that's become somehow like kind of famous or infamous, I guess I would say, in the speedrunning community especially, because uh, Forbidden Memories is notoriously a very difficult game and one that does not make a lot of sense, at least not at like first glance. So it and um, Duel Dark Duel Stories and actually a lot of the earlier Yu-Gi-Oh games, like the Sacred Cards and stuff, all follow this um, kind of, uh, I guess, like beta rules of Yu-Gi-Oh, where it's like monsters have different alignments and monsters with like certain alignments that beat other alignments will like get an advantage in battle. Either they'll automatically destroy the monster in battle or like they'll get an attack boost from it. But also in Forbidden Memories in particular, uh, there was like this fusion mechanic where basically you didn't use polymerization to fuse monsters You could just kind of choose to fuse two monsters in your hand and they would make one of a handful of like automatic different um, Result monsters so the game can be really tough because like you have to fusion summon into things like twin-headed thunder dragon I believe is like one of the really strong fusion monsters the player can make but like it's also really tough to make because you have to sort of grind to get specific cards from specific duelists and like even when you have it some of the end game bosses there's like this boss rush with like five or six opponents you have to beat all in a row and they all have like three raigekis in their decks and three dark holes and you know a bunch of really powerful fusion monsters that have like a higher attack than your guy does which you have to use like equip cards and stuff to to swing over it those old Yu-Gi-Oh video games were really wacky and like I don't want to say that they're like great games because they really don't make loads of sense but they were fun and unique games because they played differently than the Yu-Gi-Oh TCG at the time did or even like I guess the OCG whichever one you'd want to call it in fact I know a lot of those older games are technically like called different things in Japan like you know Yu-Gi-Oh Duelist game one and game two and things like that but we got actual names for them another uh, game that I wanted to talk about is the sacred cards and its sequel Reshif of Destruction this is the first time where I think Yu-Gi-Oh games really kind of came to their own I don't know the exact timeline for release but I'm just going by what I remember the Sacred Cards was on Game Boy Advance, and it's like a Yu-Gi-Oh game that actually has an overworld. And this is something that I really do think that like Yu-Gi-Oh should kind of come back to. I'm going to be mentioning a lot here. Is um, this game was based sort of roughly off the Battle City anime or whatever? But uh, like in many of these Yu-Gi-Oh video games, we'll talk about you get to kind of take on your own like character, this sort of avatar character and you are placed within the story. So you'll see characters like Yugi and characters like Joey and like, you know, Weevil, Rex, Kaiba, and everybody else from Battle City. And you can talk to them, you can oftentimes duel against them, sometimes they'll be your companions, but the story kind of more so revolves around you. And this is kind of what I mean when I think that like Yu-Gi-Oh is lacking games with like a story mode and video games that are actually like video games, right? Um, so like in these games, there is an overworld. It kind of reminds you of a top-down RPG and so like you can walk around the city talk to people learn things challenge, you know different characters Characters from the anime actually have you know their own unique character arcs in the sacred cards that like sort of play out across the game There are even things that you didn't get to see or hear in the anime And so I thought that that was kind of neat um, you get to find out for instance more about like Weevil You know kind of having this band of like weak duelists that he sort of abuses and like you know sends them out to do bad things and steal cards and stuff like that so I always thought that Sacred Cards was something that felt sort of akin to like a Pokemon game. I mean, you're not technically traveling across an entire region, but you are, you know, exploring, you know, Battle City. And that feels like, as a kid, one of the number one things that I would have wanted out of a Yu-Gi-Oh! video game was not just the ability to play Yu-Gi-Oh!, but the ability to kind of like play it like a, a Pokemon-like game where you, you know, you have a character and it's got a sprite or a 3D model or whatever, and you run around and you can go to a shop and like buy cards and things like that, or, you know, you can talk to people, learn things, there are different challenges, power up your deck. Um, and like, I guess a perfect world, maybe you go one day just has like an MMO system where you're just walking around with different character avatars and like literally dueling against anybody you want, but that's kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, but yeah, Sacred Card and Reshift of Destruction, I think did a really good job with that. And I think that this was like on the Game Boy Advance of all things was like even cooler. Also, there's like the probably most infamous, not infamous, uh, infamous goes to Forbidden Memories, probably the most like famous, beloved sort of Yu-Gi-Oh game 
was Duelist of the Roses uh, on the PlayStation 2. Now this is one that I did not get a lot of exposure to as a kid because I didn't actually have a PS2 growing up. I was one of those kids. But Duelist of the Roses, absolutely uh, just like really unique Yu-Gi-Oh game. Kind of the first one where like they weren't just following like weird, you know, old manga inspired rules, but like their own kind of a whole new system where the like game field is like just this board and you really are, you know, just like your monsters kind of travel tile by tile. It kind of vaguely reminded me of the, the Paradox Brothers with the maze, but it's really completely different than that. And there were still, I think, alignment systems in that game. The game also was one of the early 3D Yu-Gi-Oh games, so the monsters did have 3D models that would move across the field and attack. There were also like different terrains and things like that. And the most interesting thing about Duelist of the Roses was that it had a story mode that was not actually like a Yu-Gi-Oh story exactly. Like you had all the Yu-Gi-Oh characters there, but they were um, reenacting the War of the Roses. So like, I think it's Yugi and Kaiba are two sort of different warring kings or like uh, military generals or political figures or whatever from two different nations. I'm not super familiar with it, unfortunately, but I've just, I've watched like cutscenes and things. And I thought that was really cool because basically every character kind of takes on a different character from like those stories. It sort of reminds me of how like in the Sonic and the Secret Rings or Sonic and the Black Knight games, they took on like, you know, the Arabian Tales or like the Arthurian Legends. And so like different existing characters would be those characters. And that was just really neat. It was like getting a, a chance to see like, you know, your favorite characters just play out as someone else, um, sort of like role playing or cosplaying. And so yeah, like Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist of the Roses, again, just one of these games that's really it's different, it's fun, it's kind of a, it puts a different spin or twist on the Yu-Gi-Oh formula both gameplay wise and like aesthetically or story wise. Another game that I did not get to play a lot of was Falsebound Kingdom on the Nintendo GameCube, which is sort of weird because I was a GameCube kid growing up. I loved, you know, playing like Sonic Adventure 2, I played um, a lot of Mario games, a lot of Zelda games on the GameCube, Star Fox, things like that, but I did not actually get to play a lot of Falsebound Kingdom. It's kind of interesting, I actually, one of my friends, uh, Jordan, he was in a video that we did where, like, you know, he doesn't know a lot about Yu-Gi-Oh, but he has some of the older Yu-Gi-Oh games, funny enough, and so he actually found a copy of Falsebound Kingdom and, like, sent me a picture of it. He's like, hey, like, I have this old GameCube game, I remember this, I didn't know how it worked, but it was fun. So this game was cool because it actually, um, if I remember correctly, kind of, like, played actually like an RPG. So, like, monsters would go into battle and it, when you see, like, footage of it, it almost reminds you a little bit of Final Fantasy like 7's battle system maybe, like the PS1 Final Fantasy 7 where the, the monsters are sort of like in this sort of battle arena and they're fighting and there's like HP and attack and like different stats. I remember Celtic Guardian being one of the monsters in there, like from when I got to try this game out once as a kid, but other than that I don't know a whole lot more about it. I've heard that it's kind of a difficult game or like maybe a tedious one, but I can't really speak to that. Still though, this is another example of Konami and like Yu-Gi-Oh just like really experimenting, like taking the Yu-Gi-Oh brand or IP and just expanding it beyond card games because you've got, you know, Duel of the Roses where there's kind of just this like game board system. And you've got Fallsbound Kingdom that's an RPG. You've got Sacred Cards where like it's like overhead walking and running around. And then this did not actually like change. Like they kind of continued to do this. There's also a good point in time for me to mention before I go on that it's awesome that Yu-Gi-Oh video games back in the day would come with cards in the game case. So obviously, you know, Master Duel and Duel Links are like digital games. They can't really send you physical cards, but nothing was more cool than like, as a kid, when you bought video games and like, you, you know, your parents got you a new game for, you know, Christmas or your birthday, it actually would come with real life Yu-Gi-Oh cards inside. Like Dark Duel Stories has some of the most valuable copies of Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon, the DDS versions of them. Also Exodia was another one. And there's a lot of cards that came from Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. Like for a long time, Harpy's Feather Duster was only available as a video game promo. And they continued this even into like the GX and 5Ds days, where like, you know, there were, I remember the skull, um, this is kind of getting ahead of myself, but like the flame skull monsters that one of the, like Hunter Pace from Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds used, like those were cards that came in um, maybe Wheelie Breakers or something. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, like, so I think it was really cool that Yu-Gi-Oh! video games had like exclusive cards that you could get. And also another good thing to mention because this kind of goes away uh, as we talk about some of the newer games is the code system. So every Yu-Gi-Oh card that you own in real life would have a code on the bottom of it. You, you can you know see this even now and you could input the codes into the games and you would actually get a copy of that card in, in the game for you to like put in your deck. Sometimes it was like a password feature that you had to unlock, but still I thought this was a really cool way to basically sort of like scan your in-game or your real life collection into the different Yu-Gi-Oh video games. It sort of works differently from game to game. Sometimes 
some cards were and weren't available, but it's something that like doesn't, the Yu-Gi-Oh! just does not have anymore. Sort of reminds me of, sort of like how like Pokemon TCG cards have like Pokemon online, you can scan the codes for that. And I don't know, I always thought that was something sort of neat. But um, yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! cards, it was just a really cool connection point between like your physical collection and your Yu-Gi-Oh! video games that you played. And that's another sort of thing that I feel like we've lost a little bit. But anyways, moving on to other card games or other Yu-Gi-Oh! games that I remember. Um, I remember the Yu-Gi-Oh! Tag Force games were really cool. They were all on the PSP. And these were actually pretty neat because they had an overworld as well. It was kind of like this, I think the earlier Tag Force games were the GX ones. There was three GX ones and there were three 5Ds ones. And in the GX ones, there was sort of this overworld again. It was like more of like an isometric sort of top-down diagonal-ish view. I don't know what the word for that is where you like run around and it's sprite based, I think in the earlier games and later on there were like sort of 3D models. And so that was really neat because you could walk around Duel Academy, go you know outside, go to the different dorms, go to different classrooms, really exploring the world of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX that you would have seen on TV. And so that was awesome. You got to meet all the different characters and befriend them. And that's something that sort of made the Tag Force games unique was because you would tag duel with these characters. And not only would you like tag duel with them, but you also had to actually like create bonds with the characters. So it was, I guess you could vaguely call it a dating sim because you would talk to the characters and pick different options. Like you could talk to them about cards or you could talk to them about like their hobbies or about like rumors or things going on around the school. And you could even give them gifts, like different characters, like different foods or sandwiches that you can buy like a dual academy. And if you like pick the right talking options or give them the right gifts, then that'll deepen their affection with you. And then once their affection reaches a certain point, they'll be willing to like tag duel with you. And that's just really cool because that's such an like immersive thing. Because you can see in a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! video games, they'll do the whole like avatar thing where like you're just the self-insert protagonist. But this time you're really getting to like pick and choose which of the anime characters you want to like duel by your side. And that was really neat. I also remember with the Tag Force games, uh, especially as they got into the 5Ds ones in particular, there would be people who would actually like mod the games or like you could find like save files online, PSP save files that would have uh, all of the like cards unlocked and so they could actually be a pretty fun way of like playtesting decks in real life because the card pools for these games were surprisingly pretty up to date when they would release. Like obviously you know they couldn't technically keep up with every new card that would come out but still whenever there was like a yearly game because I think the Tag Force games came out from like 2006 and maybe stopped in 2011, 12, 2011 I want to say you know, that was still like a really great thing. You could actually like play the games. And so the duels were still just regular kind of duel simulator type things, like not that different from maybe a master duel or uh, an EDO pro or something today. But um, still, I just thought that it was really neat that they added this sort of like talking mechanic, I guess you could call it, you know, a dating sim mechanic into the Tag Force games. And the fact that they came out every year meant that you always had something to look forward to on the PSP. And another thing, shout out to the music in some of these games. I remember, um, one of the early 5Ds Tag Force games had really, really cool music for like um, the duels against Jack and the duels against Yusei. It just captured that like 5Ds kind of like high speed synchro summoning motorcycles sort of vibe and just atmosphere that, that 5Ds did so well. So yeah, definitely shout out to the Tag Force games. Those were something that I really think Yu-Gi-Oh! could afford to learn something from as well. Right, like talking to the characters, deepening the bonds, having relationships with them. Um, nothing like you know, weird, not weird relationships, but you know, like you know, and they, they would follow the the stories as well. So there was there was also that, like the story was also going on. I don't remember. I think the first Tag Force game, the very first one, was just like season one of GX, like season one, season two. I think it ends with basically the um, the Shadow Riders, and they kind of brainwash somebody, like some character, and so then like that becomes their tag partner, and then you're dealing with your tag partner. And like the later GX Tag Force games were like season three and season four stories, stuff like that. Another set of games that came out every year were the uh, World Championship game. The 5Ds ones, at least, were the ones that I remember. So it was like Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship 2009, 10, and 11. I think there were actually World Championship games before this, but the um, 2009 to 2011 ones were the 5Ds ones, and I remember actually playing these because I was watching 5Ds at the time. Uh, once again, you did play as kind of a self-insert protagonist, and it did follow the, the story of the anime. I think that uh, 5Ds 2009 was Stardust Accelerator, 2010 was Reverse of Arcadia, and 2011 was Over the Nexus. And so I think the first one covered the Fortune Cup, the second one covered the Dark Signers arc, and then the third one covered whatever the last uh, arc of 5Ds is called. I don't know what like, the name of it was, but basically, yeah, so 
those were basically like, you know, these story-based games, and you played them on the DS, which was fun. So like, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! was embracing the technology of the Nintendo DS a little bit. You could like have the touch screen, double screens, made it a little easier to track duels. I remember like, it takes me back to when playing games like Dark Duel Stories and Sacred Cards, just that small screen real estate made it so difficult to convey what was going on in the duels and that became a lot easier with like newer consoles. Like it wasn't so bad with the PSP and obviously on any console game, but um, yeah, the DS, like uh, 5D's World Championship games, certainly did a pretty good job of that. So like with these, when you'd play the story, you would actually like, you know, get caught by sector security and then like go to the prison and have to fight the warden and then you join like the fortune cup and so i thought that that was really neat once again there's like anime and there's kind of like a role-playing component to it so that's something that was really cool and then there were kind of a few more weird spin-off games like i remember we actually played Yu-Gi-Oh! wheelie breakers uh which this game was so it was so odd it was on the nintendo wii and so i guess that was that period of time where like everybody felt like they had to make a nintendo wii game and Wheelie Breakers was weird because it was basically like kind of Mario Kart or with like Yu-Gi-Oh, like I guess card games on motorcycles literally. It was less of a card game and more of like a racing game because you would actually hop in a dual runner, which you could customize, which is pretty cool. You could change like the color and stuff. And then you make a deck and so you were sort of turbo dueling because by dueling you would get speed counters, you could use your speed counters for your monsters to attack your opponent. And your monsters, like when you would summon them, they would actually like float alongside you like, you know, Sonic Chick or Junk Warrior would for Yusei. And um, you have life points, although like technically when you lose all your life points, I think you just spin out. Uh, it, does, it didn't really like, make you automatically lose. Uh, the thing I remember the most about this game was that all the cards kind of have slightly different effects. So I remember like Rush Recklessly, the card was literally just a speed boost in the game, which kind of makes sense. Um, but also you could like have trap cards that were sort of like items would be in a Mario Kart game. This game controlled like doo doo diarrhea. It really was not. I, I, it was not a fun game to control. Like when you start the game, your handling on your car or motorcycle or whatever is absolutely terrible. As you level up and play against different people, you are able to improve your speed and handling and things like that. So as you progress through the game, things get a little better. But I don't think a game should ever be this difficult to control from the start. That kind of doesn't work. Um, but we did do a let's play of this, which was pretty fun. It was a very difficult game. The enemies, in addition to like the bad uh, controls, also the rubber banding AI on the opponents was like really ridiculous too, so uh, we did beat it, so that was fun, but um, yeah, Wheelie Breakers was probably the last time I think that Yu-Gi-Oh! really experimented with games and different gameplay styles, because when you look back, you know, like they've now done a racing game, an RPG game, kind of different types of overhead, you know, explorative worlds and like a dating sim type games. And now that's kind of like unfortunately where the story ends because since then Yu-Gi-Oh! has not done a lot creatively with its video games. I think it's a mixer of things, right? Like the gaming industry at large is not really kind to just these like maybe like weird bad quote-unquote spin-off games where you know they, they are it's not Yu-Gi-Oh! A lot of people I think these days just want to play their Yu-Gi-Oh! card game sim. They might not be as interested in a different or quirkier like new kind of gameplay style but I think it's cool that there is like a community of people who still do like to play those games like there's the people who speed run Forbidden Memories. There is one other new game that came out and then ended and that was Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross Duel which was such a fun cool idea and I really wish Konami would be able to do more of things like this but unfortunately um so Cross Duel was like this game where the graphics and presentation of the game looked really good. It was on mobile and it was a four player game. I remember when they first teased it they were like you know it's like a four player battle royale game and you know, that got people really excited. They thought it was going to be like Battle Royale Duels, which by the way is something that I'd love to see Konami try out. But instead, you basically have like these monsters that sort of like move uh, across a game arena in like different lanes. And when the monsters encounter each other, they battle and like there's spells and traps and everything kind of does different stuff. You have like a deck leader card. You can actually give it to different effects. So it's not just a matter of like, you know, your Stardust Dragon just has these certain effects. It's like, no, you actually um can like equip different effects to your monsters, which I thought was a really cool thing. And all the different anime characters that you would have seen in Duel Links are here, even like fully voiced. Uh, I say are, but technically they were because this game shut down just like at sunset like a year after release. I remember it came out in uh, 2022. It had been teased for a while and then like it got, got like the sunset announcement kind of early in 2023 if I'm remembering the timeline correctly. And it's really unfortunate because while Cross Duel was not like a perfect game, I don't think that it really appealed to your average Yu-Gi-Oh! player and the marketing around it, like the commercials were not uh, 
right? The commercials were sort of like strange. I don't think they really captured exactly what the game was supposed to be about. But, um, and also I heard that like the, it was not very free to play friendly. Like I heard that, you know, the premium currency and all that stuff was a little bit predatory. And that kind of gets me back, uh, I guess, to the original point that I was making in the video, which is just that like, man, uh, I think the Yu-Gi-Oh games as services, where they're just sort of these live service mobile-esque games with like premium currencies and stuff, has in some ways kind of taken the soul out of the, the Yu-Gi-Oh video game. And I don't think that that's something that we're really probably going to be getting back soon, since Cross Duel did have to get Sunset and wasn't very successful. I think Konami will probably see something like that and just be like, well, okay, no more experimenting with Yu-Gi-Oh games. People clearly did not like them. Um, there are, there's some hope. I mean, I've seen that Yu-Gi-Oh! VR game that they showed at this year's Tokyo Dome event. I saw that, uh, some YouTubers got to take a look at it and there was like some brief footage. I remember seeing like Blue Eyes White Dragon and Dark Magician Girl and, um, that was always really cool. Like, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! VR sort of seems like something that Kaiba would actually make and it's something that feels like it's almost canon from the show. So that would be neat, although I wonder like exactly how that experience will go. Like I guess if it's something that you can play on like your Meta Quest or your Apple Vision Pro, then I'm not so sure how well that would sell since like not that many people have VR headsets and they're kind of expensive and it's just sort of a still unfortunately sort of niche gaming product. So I don't know if the, the like, you know, install base for that sort of game would be very good, but it would certainly be really cool to immerse yourself in a Yu-Gi-Oh! VR duel. Or, you know, imagine taking it a step further and going back to that whole like, having an overworld to run around in thing would be absolutely amazing too. So um, yeah, you know, that's kind of the state of Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. I want to reiterate that I really like Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel and I really, really like, you know, Duel Links and what they're doing. Like they, they provide a Yu-Gi-Oh! fan a way to just kind of endlessly play Yu-Gi-Oh! But I think that I would, I still kind of hearken back. I yearn for a period of time where we have Yu-Gi-Oh! video games that like try to do something, try to be different and like blaze their own path, try out different genres and surprise us. I know like Yu-Gi-Oh! is not the pop culture thing among the kids these days that it maybe once was, so perhaps there's just no hope for this, but I thought it was really cool and something I wanted to talk about. So, uh, it's been 27 minutes and some change and I actually did this all in one take. Jesus Christ, I'm really proud of myself. So you guys can let me know down below in the comments how you feel about like these Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. Do you think that it'd be nice to see Konami go back to them? Um, I guess that's one last thing to mention is that they did announce that Yu-Gi-Oh! Early Days collection that's gonna have a lot of the really, really old retro, like, you know, Game Boy Color PS1 games in this compilation and people have already seen like pre-orders and stuff up for that. So that's exciting, but I'd still like to see some new Yu-Gi-Oh! stuff as well. All right, cool. I guess that's all I have to say about Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. Um, let me know down in the comments uh, what you thought of this unscripted, kind of just off the dome style of video, because I can talk Yu-Gi-Oh! a lot uh, and a lot of different topics for uh, at length. And also what your favorite Yu-Gi-Oh! video game was or what sort of concepts you'd like to see come back. Do you want to see a, a game with tag dueling, a, a dating sim type game, an RPG, maybe even something like we haven't seen before, like a another Yu-Gi-Oh! kart racer, a fighting game perhaps, uh, something like Jump Force. Technically Yu-Gi-Oh! and Kaiba were in Jump Force, so um, that was cool that game shut down. So anyway, all right, I've gone on long enough. I will see you guys in the comments and in the next video. Past turn.